are the Orgs, and, and we, we have, have a plan. plan to watch all of Ron Moore's Battlestar Galactica and drink beer. Hello, friends, and welcome to Broadcast Galactica 3.2 with Peter and Amory. And this podcast is sponsored by Turnips R Us. Everybody seems to be getting into sponsored podcasts, so I thought we'd jump on the barrel. So if you're looking for tasty turnips, Look no further than turnipsrus.com. Okay. Plenty of backhanders from that. Splendid. Anyways, on to night two, which I discovered why they're called night one and night two, and it's not very exciting, the answer, I'm afraid. Is there one head on the first it's night? night and one head on the second, night. exactly. So there's me thinking it was some sort of plot thing. No. 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 <laughs> A.K.A. an hour and a half into the miniseries, okay? But that's yeah. less exciting than saying night two, so there you yeah. go. I'm an observer of human nature. <laughs> When you get right down to it, humanity is not a pretty race. I mean, we're only one step away from beating each other with clubs like savages fighting over scraps of meat. Maybe the Cylons are God's retribution for our many sins. What if God decided he made a mistake and he decided to give souls to another creature like the Cylons? God didn't create the Cylons. Man did. And I'm pretty sure we didn't include a soul in the programming. Let's go. So you've got the chief and Starbuck comes in on the Viper and he wants to know what on earth she's done to it. And there is like chunks missing out of it. It's probably messed up, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And so then Starbuck finds out about the deaths. You've then got Boomer with her raptor full of civilians and she's launching comms drones to see if they can get anyone to come and find them. And she's having a conversation with Boxy. Hey! Yeah. And unlike most of the actors who we've not seen in anything else up till now, ironically, it's this kid actor, Conno Widows, that does crop up again in other things we've seen. X-Men 2 and 3 as Jones, a student at Xavier's school. He's the one who can control electrical systems with his mind. Mm-hmm. Boxy's dad was the, the armistice officer right at the beginning so uh-huh. I think I probably mentioned in the yeah. previous podcast. There was some fear that this kid would keep cropping up, but slight spoiler, you don't have to worry about that too much. I think he maybe crops up once more and that's it. Yeah. Phew. It's a relief. <laughs> it's sort of a, another of those little nods to the old series which they make and then move swiftly on. And so you then got Baltar in this raptor and Six appears and says that she loves that, you know, Gaius is there and he's a survivor. And then you have a quite a long scene with Galactica doing FTL jump prep. And the launch bay's coming in, I love that. That's yeah, such it sort a brilliant of shrinks, idea. Doesn't it? Yeah, and, uh, and you can see why that, that would be a sort of vulnerable bit, so they'll bring it in yeah. before they jump. And they jump to Thor Ragnarok. Didn't they, yes. Ragnarok station, anyway, yes. Oh, and, and, and in order to do the jump, they have like a big blue key thing, yeah. which is a really cool. It's probably the most sci fi it gets, really, that blue key thing. It looks like a tuning fork. That glows. Yes. And they do the Jaws camera thing. Yeah. Uh, it's got a special name, I can't remember what it's called now, but it's where they, that they have the camera on a track and they pull it back, so it makes the perspective all go really weird. But it's a lovely effect for jumping. Yes. You find out that Colonial One has survived because Apollo managed to set off a massive EMP. Yeah, this is a sort of big chunk of technobabble that apparently Moore put in as a, a sort of joke reference to Trek and then later on regretted doing, but there you go. It, we don't generally get technobabble in, in Galactica, thankfully, so... And then you have various complicated turning manoeuvres while you can see the bodies being come and and laid out. And then Starbuck removes from her locker uh, a photo of her and Zack with Apollo and she prays to the Lords of Kobol. Yeah, she's quite spiritual in this, which is nice. We'll get another example of that a bit later on as well. Yeah. And then so Galactica docks with Thor Ragnarok. (laughs) <laughs> it's an interesting design of station, isn't it? It's sort of loads of it's a nightmare of sort of rotating loops, presumably to give it artificial gravity. Which is a point. How does Galactica have artificial gravity? Anyway, let's not worry about that now and move swiftly on. <laughs> yeah. And then this bloke is there and he's pointing a gun at the chief. Leoban. Yes, he's played by Callum Keith Rennie. Now I recognise that name. Okay, uh, he had a reoccurring role on Jessica Jones, which we didn't see. He was in The Man in the High Castle, though, which we have seen. Yes. So, possibly. He's in Fifty Shades of Grey, but we won't hold that against him. But it's it's a wonderful, creepy performance from him in this. It's rather cool. 
And uh, the whole inside is filmed at a combination of a British Columbia railway building and a, a sugar mill, which apparently was a really horrible environment to film in. You can I kind of see it. all the dust and crap floating around. But it just it's great because it looks real. It's, yeah. it's clearly not a set. So it just a it's cheaper because they didn't have to build it, and b it just lends a lovely sense of yeah. realism to it. It does, it does. I really like it. And then you've got Boomer helping people off the Raptor because they've found safety, and she's explaining to Apollo about the old Vipers. Yeah, did that feel like a bit of a jump to you? It did a little bit. Yeah, there's apparently a missing scene that they didn't have time for, where basically sort of. Boomer has a chat with Apollo and explains where she's been because they, they seem to be midway through a conversation, which seems real consi- weird considering they're you know sort of significant characters. But that's the reason why. Yeah, and then you've got the president asking to see Bolta um wants him to be her chief scientific advisor, <laughs> which you know makes sense if he's yes. got a reputation as a scientific genius. That's what you're going to want to do, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And then you're back with Chief and Leo, and I just love the way the Chief deals with the idiot. He's just yeah. like, unless you think you can shoot all of these people with one gun, just shut the fuck up and move out the way. <laughs> and then Bolter on Colonial One C six again, and um, he's trying to work out how the Cylons took down the defence system. And she says she she wants him to love her, and then sort of he go she goes to kiss him, and then he sort of comes to on his own, going no. Yes. So, proof is proof we needed that she isn't really there. Yeah, she's kind of in his mind somehow. Mm. The question is, how is she? Yeah. In, is, is Later she... on, she suggests that she might be a chip that's been implanted, yeah. which is a bit freaky. Yeah. So, Leoben claims to be a rogue arms dealer. And then you sort of shout, so be careful with that. And then suddenly, bang, there's an explosion. Mm-hmm. But Adama's okay. But they're trapped, Loban and Adama, in that sort of bunker thing. Which is kind of a standard trope, isn't it? You yeah. know, you stick your hero in with, well, as it turns out, one of the villains. So it's a good way of, sort of gradually being able to reveal stuff about the Cylons as well. He says he's going to take Adama out by another route. And then you have a botanical ship yeah. with a cheesy child on. <laughs> yes, yeah, shame about the child. But yeah, aggro ships, remember them? Yeah. They're back in the new series, if briefly, it has to be said, with a similar dark style design. This one's got a, bit, a few more pods on it. And inside it's uh, apparently a floral conservatory in Vancouver. And I love the way the dome in it matches, because they didn't purposely build that, that's the dome of this floral centre, it matches the CG model, mm. so it, it just really feel like they're inside the ship, which is cool. But yeah, that kid is it's like one of the elements of the original series, you kind of feel like, no, no, we didn't need that. Yeah. <laughs> and then you get to sort of start seeing the fleet, because everyone's rendezvousing, and some of them look really cool, including sort of the one with the big wheels on it. That yeah, I that's a new one. There's some that are versions of the original series. Yeah, you've like got the, the toilet seat. Toy- toilet seat is indeed back. Yeah, the Gemini Freighter is back as well. But uh, yes, that that long one, I'm going to have to look that one up and find what that is. But yes, that wasn't in the original series. I think it looks cool, whatever it is. I like it. And then the, the fleet are spotted by Asylum Raider. So Apollo says, you've got to do immediate FTL, go now. And other people are going, yeah, but we, we need time to put the civilians on the ship. And Lee's going, no, you haven't got time. They're like, you can't leave thousands of people behind. It's like, it's either that or we lose everyone. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, all the while doing that irritating revolving camera thing again. It's like, oh, stop it. Yeah. But what well, you say, it's irritating. I don't find it so irritating in this particular scene, because you can imagine Rosalind's head spinning with all of this <laughs> and kind of the camera... Yeah, I don't need that visualised, really. It just makes me dizzy. OK, <laughs> There are times I mind it, times I don't. didn't mind it this occasion. And she's talking to Billy, who just makes me think of gremlins. <laughs> Billy. Billy. Anyway, she says that she's got cancer and he'd guessed from certain things that she'd said and done or whatever... And then he says, well, I thought you should know that girl you met, she won't survive. It's like, you cunt, why did you say that? Yeah, yeah, nice. I mean, she could probably work that out for herself, but there's no need to underline it for her. But also, surely a botanical ship has got important food and supplies. Why the fuck does it exist if it doesn't have FTL? What is it doing as a thing? Surely the botanical ship with food on, surely it should, if it's there to help with deep space missions and everything else, it should have FTL in order that it can supply food for deep space missions. Mm -hmm. It makes no sense whatsoever that that ship, you know, you could have, you should have had the kid on a different ship and that one couldn't jump. The idea that, you know, the aggro ship doesn't have FTL is just stupid. (laughs) 
Yeah, I don't know. But anyway, it doesn't for whatever reason. Yeah. Oh, by the big the big big ring we're on, by the way, yeah. is an Intersun Luxury Liner. Right. Yes. And the toilet seat ship is the prison barge again. Hey! And we'll get more of that later on. Uh-huh. Then Leoben says that allergies are making him ill. And then he sort of starts philosophising and says, you know, did God, you know, look down on humanity and decide that humanity was crap and then gave souls to the Cylons? And I was like, people made Cylons, not God. No, we didn't put souls in there. Soul not included. Yeah. <laughs> it was printed on the box. <laughs> and then you've got ships the, the on Galactica, incoming ships, and it's all, you know, ship, you know, action stations, but those ships are friendly. And it includes Roslyn, and there's an argument between Roslyn and Ty about what they're going to do and who's in charge, which you kind of expect, really. And then you've got a, a, a nice scene, which I like, which is where you've got Billy wandering around trying to find somewhere and, and then you, uh, with Baltar. And it's like, if this place was a museum, at least they could have given us a map, yeah. which I like. <laughs> I like. And then you watch the Chief be reunited with Boomer, and they're not hiding it. They're not trying to pretend. No, the poor old box is stood there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then, as she walks past in the the corridor, Dee kisses Billy. Mm-hmm. Uh, which slightly feels like it comes out of nowhere. I mean, obviously there was that initial scene yeah. with him following her into the bathroom because he was lost. But apparently there would have been another scene with a bit more interaction with them, but that got cut as well. And then Apollo comes and passes by Starbuck and just sort of stands there, and she's like, I thought you were dead. And then there's a whole load of tension in the scene and I'm not going to give anything away but this is one of the bits that I remember so I know this this goes somewhere this tension between mm-hmm. them meanwhile Leoban looks a right fucking mess the makeup is excellent it's brilliant both on him and later on on Adama where he's all splattered with yeah, blood as well yeah it's awesome so Adama works out that he's a Cylon and so Leoban says that you know when he dies and he goes you know just gets another body when he goes back to wherever central Cylon processing is, or whatever you want to call it, he's going to tell the others where they are. But Adama's like, no, nah, actually, I think you're stuck in this body and you can't get out and, you know, everything's on the fritz. And then the, the guy quotes his own speech back at him. The day comes when you can't hide from the things you've done. Mm, yes, it's very much sort of theme of the, the series, really. Yeah. And they have a massive fight, which is a proper fight. Yes. And the Dharma ends up covered in this dude's blood. Yeah. And he hit, he's hitting him because all he's got to hand is his torch. So he's yeah. using that, which apparently was Olomos' idea. And the studio wasn't happy with it, but they'd already filmed it. So there was nothing they could do. So. Yeah. But, you know, this this is guy represents someone who's just tried to destroy the whole of humanity. Mm. It's not a disproportionate reaction. Definitely not. Um, and then you've got Gator with Baltar. Saying, you know, you must feel bad that the Cylons have used your system against you to attack humanity. And he points out that Galactica never used it because their computers aren't networked. And then he's seeing Six again and he's trying to maintain a conversation with Gator whilst also somehow making the words make sense in terms of his conversation with Six. And she points him towards a specific piece of kit which he recognises as being like one in her briefcase, and she says she didn't put it there, so there has to be another side on aboard the ship. Bam, bam, bam. And Six plants the idea in Baltar's head that the silent device is a bomb, but he's got to think of a way of breaking the news without, to others without giving away that he knows it's of Cylon origin. Doral rocks up, whilst uh, Baltar and Six are basically making out, which is rather amusing, and Baltar decides that Doral can be the patsy, but Six points out she hasn't seen him at any of the Cylon parties, I love which that. is a nice line. <laughs> the problem is no one else knows the Cylons look human, so you can't tell anybody. Except, of course, Adama has just been rescued and has broken the news to Ty, and they take off Leoban's body to be examined. The commander has a moment with his son, which is sweet. Apparently neither actor wanted their characters to hug. They wanted to keep them more sort of a mm. distance at this stage. But they were talked into doing it as long as they showed the sort of the that lovely awkwardness mm. afterwards. Like, where do we go from here? I don't know. I'm just going to walk out the room. <laughs> Adama charges Baltar with developing a Cylon detector. <laughs> Funny scene as they break the news to him that they look human now. Apparently Callis kept making almost crack up in this scene. Just through having a straight yeah. face throughout Starbuck confesses to Apollo that she passed Zack for flying, despite the fact that he wasn't capable of it. And it, she says it's a, an end-of-the-world confession. So again, she's quite a sort of spiritual person. Mm. On Baltar's advice, Captain Kelly arrests Doral, but Ty asks Baltar why he wasn't sick due to Ragnar's radiation. The Doctor puts that down to the short time he's been exposed and tells Ty about the device on the Dradis. 
You're thinking at this point that it's horribly unfair that Daryl has been set mm. up, especially when they decide to strand him at Ragnar yeah. a bit later on. Starbuck on patrol reports to CIC the Cylons have found them, and sure enough, they, you see a huge base star yeah, looming massive. over Ragnar. It's weird they didn't send a raptor for this. I would have thought that would have been more logical, but uh, there you are. Maybe they had to repair it. Mm. Well, they've got several, I should think. We finally get a face-off between Rosalind and Adama. It's government versus martial law. He just wants to seek out the enemy, but she points out again that the war is over. And running is the only option to allow the human race to survive by having babies. Mm. And he just walks out on her. Jumping out of Ragnar isn't possible due to electric interference. Whilst his officers are discussing what to do next, Adama is watching Billy and Duala chatting and just comes out with, they'd better start having babies. <laughs> is that an order? Ty replies, which is great. <laughs> they decide to jump to the Prolmar sector, which is further than anyone has jumped before. But they'll need to be clear of the interference, so they have to hold back the Cylons while the civilians jump first. Fleet begins to move. We see Galactica's turrets fire up, very reminiscent of the original series again, but this mm. time it's not lasers they're firing, but traditional ammunition. And it's, it's this great sort of whole sort of pillar of fire that they yeah. launched, stopping the um, firepower of the base stars it's kind and of like the a raiders. Gun, and, isn't it? Yeah, but the whole idea is it's like a curtain of, yeah. of munitions that uh, stops the you know the baddies from hitting them. Meanwhile, you've got seventy-two raiders launching from the base star with their eerily shrieking noise. And it's just wonderful effect shots. Yeah. Really cool. Vipers engage the raiders, and it's all very crunchy. With ships getting blasted to bits. This is the stuff that you need CG for. That's very yeah. hard to do with models. And you've got none of your superimposed explosions either. Because you know, whereas in the original series they didn't want to blow up any of their precious models. Here they can blow yeah. up CG ones with no effect. Yeah, I really like the way that this is shot as well because it's Trek is very static, kind of on a plane, and this is all over the shop, isn't mm-hmm. it? It's it all is. different angles and upside down and yeah, as space indeed is. Uh, and some of the raiders actually have shots on target as well, so it's another yeah. departure from the original yeah. series. The recall order is given, but Starbuck and Apollo are still out there as his ship is damaged. Uh, it's a wonderful performance from Sakoff as she's like, she's she crashes into his ship and goes to fly in through the tiny gap yeah. that's left as the landing pods are closing. And uh, you're going in a bit hot, aren't you? Am I? <laughs> and there's like yeah. this mad, scary <laughs> look on her face. <laughs> Then we get Elosha leading a requiem service, although quite how they retrieved the pilots' bodies before jumping is a bit of a mystery, it has to be said. Since I, I presume it was for the guys who died in the fire. No, because there are, are some along the back that have got the helmets on them. Okay. So it's, it could some of them certainly could be, but not all of them, yeah. And we get our introduction to So Say We All, their version of Our Men. Adama isn't impressed with the response, so he gets the congregation to repeat it until he's happy with it. Something that always annoys me in church, but there you go. Yeah. <laughs> So say we all. 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 Are they the lucky ones? That's what you're thinking, isn't it? We're a long way from home. We've jumped way beyond the red line into uncharted space. Limited supplies, limited fuel, no allies, and now, no hope. Maybe it would have been better for us to have died quickly, back on the colonies with our families, instead of dying out here slowly in the emptiness of dark space. Where shall we go? What shall we do? Life here began out there. Those are the first words of the sacred scrolls. And they were told to us by the lords of Kobol many countless centuries ago. And they made it perfectly clear that we are not alone in this universe. Elosha, there is a 13th colony of humankind, is there not? Yes. The scrolls tell us a 13th tribe left Kobol in the early days. They traveled far and made their home upon a planet called Earth. Unbelievably, it was an ad-lib from Olmos, showing that Adama had realised that the crew needed their spirits lifted. And it's also the first scene that he filmed as well. Wow. Which, you know, is like, he's straight into role. I love the fact uh, in his great speech, he he says that life here began out there. It's, you know, that wonderful echoes of the original series. 
Hey, it's just a fantastic performance. I mean, Olmos is, is every bit a worthy replacement for Lorne Green, let's yeah. face it. And everybody cheering was spontaneous as well. Ty congratulates Starbuck on her flying and apologises for ruining the card game. And in return, she calls him a bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Being a dangerously weak drunk. So no easy resolutions to character conflicts yeah. here, which is good. <laughs> Rosalind goes to see Adama and pulls his bluff over Earth, as it's actually a legend. He argues it's given the fleet something to live for, though. She asks for restoration of a civilian government, which he kind of agrees to as long as he gets to make the military decisions. Mm. And uh, as she walks in, he's, he's stuffing noodles into his face mm. at a rate of knots. Apparently, that was almost his idea as well. I don't know what he's got about eating noodles. I mean, oh, it's so a, supposed to be eating a blade. Exactly, runner. it's something that Gaff does as well. Yeah. yeah, I think he must really like noodles. I think he just likes noodles. Six raises the possibility with Baltar of there being Cylon sleeper agents who don't yeah. know. What they are. Hmm, strokey gin. We have things getting back to some sort of normality, including Ty feigning to keep off the drink. Oh. He puts the bottle in the bin, gets it out again. <laughs> Starbucks smoking a stoogie for our old set time's sake. And Adama refusing to give time to talk to his son, before then finding a note that says that there are only 12 Cylon models. Who left it? Ooh. Well, originally it was going to be revealed it was Baltar, but more decided to run with the uncertainty, so you'd never find out. Mm-hmm. Aboard the Ragnar station, we see uh, some of the 12 models, which does include the very ill looking Doral, along with other sixes and the Obans, who are number twos. Eww. And Doral turns out to be a number five. And you'll note that leaves plenty of numbers to be revealed yet, which kind of feels wrong. It's like, well, there are so many of the same models here, but of course, it's sort of necessary mm-hmm. for dramatic tension. The fact that they're all wearing the same clothes is a bit odd as well, but it's because this is a complicated motion control shot, ironically using robotic controlled mm. cameras. <laughs> Cylon cameras. We also get our first look at the traditional Centurions since the start of the miniseries, highlighting that this version is all about the humanoid versions, really. Mm. So don't expect to see lots of them because the effect was expensive and not always that effective, it has to be said. They talk about having to track down the humans lest they return to take revenge. And the number eight, aka Boomer, says that they'll get them in the end. By your command, Six replies, which is a very nice touch mm. and callback. Grace Park didn't know that Boomer was going to turn out to be a silent because originally she'd auditioned for Starbuck, so that was a bit of a surprise to her, apparently. Gosh. And then we play out to drums and a bit of strings, which is as close as they get to a theme tune, yeah. which is not exactly memorable, but there we go, that's the different style that they're going for. And there we have it, second part of the miniseries, all very action-packed. Yeah. If the, the first part seemed a bit talky and slow, this certainly makes up for it. And that final battle is just fantastic. I really like it. I like the fact that Adama gets to punch the shit out of Leoban as well. <laughs> it's very satisfying. Right. He's a creepy. Yeah. And I, I, I like Six as well. There's certain things she says, like, Gator is going, you know, you must feel guilty. And he's going, yes. And Six is going... No, you don't. <laughs> That's why I like you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah their, their, their relationship is really interesting. Yeah. yeah. And the whole thing about, you know, you don't know who is and isn't going to be a silent. There are plenty of other models out there to discover yet. It's nice yeah. sort of seeding. Uh, but I like as well the whole, you know, we've got to be really careful because in terms of who we tell and, and what, because otherwise people are going to say that someone's a silent because they haven't cleaned their teeth in the morning. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah, they can't keep hold on top of that for too long, I don't suppose. But yes. No. So yeah, generally I really like it. I like the look and the the feel of it. Although there was one moment where a bloke who is on a chair with wheels, why, ends up diving headfirst through a screen of glass. Yes. And you think, that's not very practical, is it? (laughs) On a bridge, but I suppose they're not supposed to be moving much, are they, So usually? so. Yeah, Mm. even so, it's still... (laughs) But I think the reason I noticed the little things like that is because everything else is done in such a realistic way, it stands out. And again, filming in actual places. Yeah also helps as well for that level of realism here we go so we enjoyed it but what did other people think Doreen has this to say great doubler to get us all interested in this series the musical score certainly helps the audience to get emotionally involved along with the much improved script writing I'm really getting a post Frankenstein vibe from this okay Adama is a liar and Boomer is a Cylon so say we all I was unfortunately reminded of Delia's Where Are You at Norwich Stadium when Adama was trying to get some feeling into the fleet's Amen. I mean, so we say we all. Okay, that, that's a reference to, for our international listeners. Oh God, we've got to explain Delia Smith from Norwich Football Club now. Oh, fuck, story. <laughs> 
So she, yeah, hosted cookery programs, and then I don't know if she actually took over the football club, but she's, she's part, on the board. On the board, yes. Yeah, <laughs> just okay. Yeah, let's just move on. Glory um. <laughs> says hope, but false hope. Is this a good basis for a civilization? Well, Interesting it can't, point. Can't be much worse than ours with all its fake news. No, oh, indeed. Yeah. And doesn't Pratchett have something to say about what people keeps people going is hope? Yes. Even if it's not realistic, even if it's only very slim, it's what keeps people alive. Mm. We've also heard from Sampo. I come back to you now at the turn of the tide. So, yes, hello, Orcs. I'm back and I'm here to give feedback for Battlestar Galactica, the good version. Hmm. I skipped both the older, older series, but I did still enjoy listening to you suffer through them. Thank you, I think. Mm. <laughs> and since BSG is one of my favourite sci fi shows, this was a perfect opportunity to rewatch the series. I actually haven't w- watched any BSG since Series 4 ended, so maybe the 10 year gap will allow me to rediscover at least part of it with fresh eyes. I think the only bit we'd rewatched since the series ended was the mini series, so yeah. Yeah. I'm feeling back on the whole mini series because we watched the whole thing in one go and I'm really having trouble separating what happened in parts one and two. That's fair enough. So the mini series I remember quite well since I've seen it multiple times. As a result, I'm having trouble thinking of things to say since all it all seems obvious. I adore the camera work and the models. Adama Senior oozes charisma, and he the does. whole Cylon invasion is very haughtingly done. I know it's due to budget issues, but I actually think it's extremely effective that we don't see almost any of the actual fighting. We see people reacting to the news, and that lets our imaginations fill in the gaps. Yeah. Also, the last time I watched this, I didn't have any children, but now I do, and that scene where Six kills the baby really punches me in the gut. Yeah. Mm. As, as we said last time, it was almost a deal-breaker for us, yeah. wasn't it? I think it is implied that she killed the baby so that he wouldn't have to suffer in the coming war, but it was still quite distressing to watch. Yeah. One thing always bugged me in this episode, and it still bothers me even after this rewatch, when Baltar accuses Doral of being a Cylon, it's heavily implied that Baltar is just framing him to save his own neck. But in the end, it is revealed that he was a Cylon after all. So was Baltar just incredibly lucky? Or had he really invented a silent detector? It's still unclear to me. I don't think he's invented a silent detector because he's clearly selling a load of yeah. bull to Ty, basically, isn't he? <laughs> and relying on the fact that Ty doesn't understand a word he's saying anyway. But, yeah. You know, I think he's just lucky that he's ended up... Oh, how much has he actually been guided by six? Mm, hard to say. Well, I think he did say this guy's got loads of access to crucial it's areas logical. and he's not a member of the crew. So yeah. I think, I think it... It's an educated guess that he's yeah. making, I think. So it's not groundless. No. But he could be. It's not that he knows knows. And ultimately, he doesn't care whether or not he is. He's just a, a you know a patsy that yeah. he's that easily call upon. And as it turns out, he was right. But since those are the things I was left pondering about, I'll give some room for a new voice. I'm actually watching this series with my wife, Yona, who has never seen the series before. In fact, she really doesn't watch almost any sci-fi, so I think she'll have a unique perspective. She had no idea what Asylum was before we started, and up until the end of the episode, when they start looking for Earth, she thought the episode actually took place in our solar system. Well, they do talk about humanity, so yeah. On the whole, she liked the miniseries, although it was terribly dark. Mm. (laughs) Oh, you might want to warn it, it it, it does get darker. (laughs) The plot kept her interested. It reminds her a lot of The Expanse, Mm, one of the few other sci-fi series I've managed to get her to watch. She really liked the fact that everyone is using old technology because everything more advanced is susceptible to silent viruses. I must admit, that is one of the things I find charming about the show as well. Her favourite character was President Rosalind because her motivations were clear and she liked her humane attitude to things. Yona also liked Starbuck, although she was a bit too butch for her tastes. Yeah. She liked the anarchy she brought to the show. Yeah. Yeah, she does that. Her least favourite character was Apollo. Oh, yeah. yeah. Who she considered to be a whiny bitch with daddy issues. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Harsh, but fair. She is really interested in which direction Baltar will go as a character. Ooh. He seems completely unpredictable at the moment. She's also curious, is Six really there, or just a figment of his imagination? Mm. Don't expect quick answers on that one, is all I'm going to say. And of course, she's already speculating on who is a silent and who is not. So you also have the quite outlandish theory that everyone is a Cylon. <laughs> but then what would be the point of the war? Okay. I don't think it's a spoiler to say that not, not everybody, everybody is a Cylon. Is a Cylon. <laughs> she also considered the possibility that there are Cylon animals. For example, a cat would be quite an efficient infiltrator. To her, the theme of the series seems to be that you cannot trust anyone or anything. And returning to my comments, it's really refreshing to watch the series alongside new eyes. I know where all the characters end up and their character arcs, but watching Yana speculate about them brings me back to when I was watching for the first time. 
I'm really looking forward to this rewatch and hearing you talk about the episodes as well. So say we all. So say we all. Thank you, Sampu. Thank you. And we've heard from Jeff, who writes, Wow, this opening miniseries is phenomenal. Phenomenal. <laughs> I was so engrossed in it that two-thirds of the runtime had already re- passed before I realised, so I ended up watching the whole thing in one go. I was having trouble separating the two halves in my mind, and I can be quite lazy, so I figured I'd just cover it all. <laughs> the first thing I'll mention is the cast. Just superb. Edward James Olmos' Adama is almost frighteningly gruff and weathered, but has a wonderful warmth too. Yeah. He's the kind of guy who's more terrifying when he whispers than almost anyone shouting, but he gives a good rousing speech right when it's needed. Mary MacDonald as Laura Roslin. Could there have been better casting? Mm. Roslin may be my favourite character in the entire series and has such a strong start here. She has problems enough on her own when the world ends and she finds herself improbably in charge of keeping humanity alive. She more than rises to the occasion and convincingly portrays the strain of this sudden responsibility. Gaius Baltar, another highlight. James Callis, who I was convinced was Alexander Siddig when I first <laughs> got this back in <laughs> They do look similar, don't they? Yeah. Gives life to such an amazingly slimy character. It's a delight watching him weasel his way through one tight spot after another, but he's convincingly devastated by the disaster he inadvertently helped bring about. Everyone is on top form. Ty, the washed-up drunk who has to step up in a moment of crisis. Tyrrell, a real man of the people blue-collar character, loves his people and his work. Apollo is a lot like his original series counterpart, solidly heroic, but now with daddy issues. Starbuck, from the time being, is a hotshot pilot with a chip on her shoulder and problem with, with anger management. Mm. There were moments it felt like Katie Sackhoff seemed to be directly channelling Dirk Benedict. <laughs> but I felt the same way about Bradley Cooper as Face Man in the 18 movie, so it might just be me. I was doing a disservice to Trisha Helfer in my memories, dismissing her as just a pretty blonde in slinky clothes. But she's truly compelling and very scary. She is quite creepy as yeah. well. Yeah, no, she's just... I love characters that only one person can see, and she's excellent as the perhaps imaginary number six. There's only really one character I didn't like, Roslyn's assistant Billy. I don't think it's the actor's fault, but I just found him to be a bland milk toast nobody. Well, I've rambled on, and I haven't even got to the best part, the spaceships. Mm-hmm. They look so great. I think they've held up very well. I love the updated versions of the Galactica and the cool Mark II Vipers. The new Cylon Raiders are just fantastic. The big climactic space battle is beautiful. Hordes of arcing missiles, fighters flipping and dodging, the little details of the reaction control thrusters firing away. Mm. It's everything a spaceship nerd could want. (laughs) In summation, this is absolutely excellent. Aspects of the original series have been incorporated and reimagined perfectly. Everything from Zack to the botanical ship being a reproduction of the agricultural vessels. They even did the episode Fire in Space in about five minutes. Mm -hmm. The best new aspect is the humanoid Cylon concept. It gives the series a sense of dread and paranoia for the humans, but asks interesting questions about the nature of life. Summed up nicely right at the beginning when Six asks Foxy's dad if he's alive. I'll apologise for going on and on. I'm overly excited. Very much looking forward to the series going forward and experiencing it with you all. Great new opening on the podcast. Another excellent piece of music from Drew Barker. Mm. Great new cover art too. I've been amusing myself thinking of a phantom Anne-Marie tormenting Baltar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as long as you don't cast me as Baltar, I'm fine with that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. MP3-wise, we've heard from all. Hello, Peter and Anne-Marie. It's all here. I'm feeding back on both parts of the Battlestar Galactica miniseries. I don't know, it's very long. You know, it's two hour and a half episodes. It's it's a good old slog to get through. And certainly I think the first hour is very slow. Really, until the bombs start dropping, it's... I'm, I'm not going to say boring, but it's definitely... It, it's all building up. It's not, not doing anything in and of itself. After that, when when the attack finally comes, it certainly it picks up in, in tension. It's interesting the characters we're following, which is... Broadly speaking, the Adamas, we've got Boltar, Gaius Boltar, and then we've got um, Boomer and Hilo. Um, and they're, they're you know, going on very different paths, which is kind of an interesting way of, of plotting that story. Boltar is poss- possibly the most interesting, given that he's quite, you know, venal and... He's, he's not a villain, but it is all his fault. You know, he, he's, a, he, he's not um, dear old John Colicos, but... He he is and would be perceived to be the villain of the piece if everyone knew what he'd done, um, and probably quite right too. 
then Boomer and Hilo going down to Caprica is very reminiscent of similar scenes with um, Adama and Apollo in the original um, Saga of a Star World episodes, but done in a way that brings home that they're going to have to make very difficult choices, which I like. I like that echo. I think. I, I think a lot of the things with this series is that. Yes, it is Battlestar Galactica, and I get why it's a remake of Battlestar Galactica, but in many ways it could be its own thing because it's actually doing its own thing. Uh, but but I do like the odd nods that we do have to stories and, and story points from the original series. I'm, what I'm not so keen on is the relationship between Lee and um, Commander Adama. I think that might just be me. I quite like a good Space Dad relationship, and, you know, I... I know they get there in the end, you know, you can tell that even by the end of the end of the uh, second episode, but I'm not keen on this this whole thing that they've got going on to start with. Um it just seems a bit, I don't know, I'm um, unremittingly grim and, and awful, which I, actually I think is my problem with the whole thing is it is just unrelentingly grim and ugh, there's no no let up to it. Um even Starbuck is not really given any room to be, you know, fun to be around. It, you know, none of these people feel like people you'd actually want to spend like a night in the pub with, because God, you'd be you'd be wanting to top yourself at the end of that, wouldn't you? And and I think that's going to be my sort of problem with the series as a whole. But we'll see as we go on what what it's going to end up with. But I, I do just worry that I don't know. It's all just terribly po faced. Lots of interesting ideas, but the execution and the tone of the execution is. Just a bit, bit too grimdark for my tastes. Um, without any of the sort of the the fun that that could go with it. But you know, thank you very much for the podcast. I am looking forward to going through this again at some point. I'll tell the story of how I man- ended up watching it in the first time round. But um, but for now, I think it's uh, it's a bit of a wobbly start from me. You know, it's all good and it's all proficient, but it just yeah, it's not quite doing what I feel the need for right now. Well. Thank you very much, and I will speak to you next time, probably, unless I don't, in which case it'll be the time after that, or at some point in the future. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. That's a definite answer there. Um, (laughs) It is certainly long, which is why we split it in two. I've always found it quite a a difficult one to watch in one sitting. I mean, it's exciting, but it just takes so long to do it. It's very very rarely you've got over three hours to set aside to watch one thing, so... And it does get darker, just to warm folk. I don't, well, it certainly doesn't get any lighter anyway, put it that way. And, th- and there aren't particularly any lighter characters. There's no sort of comic relief or anything like that. So if that's going to be an issue for you, it's going to continue to be an issue for you throughout yeah. the series. Yeah. And that's I mean, partly just because of the situation they're in. They're, realistically, you know, they're the last surviving human beings. There isn't a lot of room for you know, happy-go-lucky, jolly stuff. And the one time they do try it, you know, they quite quickly rise. It doesn't really work in this setting, so... Yeah. And the, the sense of no let-up is deliberate. Mm. Because that is the situation they're in. But it's still... I didn't find watching it felt too relentless, I think, because there's enough... Because if it was just slowly they all died, I don't think we would be covering it. No. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so there's... You get the plus points you get some victories do you know what I mean there is no in one sense in overall there's no let up but you will get positive moments and for me that was one of the things that kept me watching mm-hmm. what did Andrew make of this what do you hear Borecast so previously on Borecast Galactica my feedback had the theme of moderation this week on Borecast Galactica the theme is going to be test or testing I feel like there's a lot of testing that goes on. The, the first half of the miniseries puts like, sort of sets up the situation, and now the second half puts things to the test. And I'll start with the Galactica itself, which is put to the test properly against the Cylons, and acquits itself very well, gets physically in between the Cylons and the civilian fleet, lets them jump to safety. I think Roslyn has her first test, in um, ordering the jump-capable ships to jump away, but leave the non-jump-capable ships behind. And again, carrying on from last feedback, I think there is a professionalism in her when she does that. It's You can see it. it's a decision that weighs on her quite a lot, but there's no hand-wringing over it. There's no histrionics over it. It's just 
this is the practicality of the situation you need to make a choice and she makes a choice and she settles on it and that's when she properly steps up to the responsibilities that she has as the president of what remains of the 12 colonies the one line that rings out for me in that um, sequence is the person over the wireless saying I hope you people rot in hell for this which doesn't come across at all as figurative so that's Rosalind's first uh, test of whether she can shoulder the responsibilities of the presidential office which it seems like she passes if you can apply a pass fail to that sort of thing Adama faces similar tests as well uh, he has a kind of physical test in his fight against fake Ray Vecchio, which he answers by bludgeoning him to death with a torch. But there are, I think, two more tests of leadership for him. The first one is deciding not to use the Galactica in a one-ship war against the Cylons, but to use the Galactica to protect the civilian fleet. So that's one. The second one, I think, is the test of leadership at the end of the miniseries, giving hope and purpose to the fleet. It's not enough to just live, you have to have something to live for. Uh, which he answers by lying, which is kind of interesting. He lies to the fleet. I know where Earth is, I'm going to take us there. Which is a lie that Roslyn agrees to keep secret, which I think is intended to make it clear to Adama that Roslyn is on his level. Adama's a veteran Battlestar commander, he's introduced as an authority figure, and we understand him to be an authority figure right from the start and here's this person who he dismissed as a school teacher not that long ago saying i'll keep your secret i'll share responsibility for this lie that you've told to the fleet she says to him if they find out you lie they're never going to forgive you if she's complicit in that they're never going to forgive her either and her putting herself on the hook like that is her again shouldering the responsibilities of being the leader of the fleet. So that's another test for Rosalind, test of leadership, which she passes. And I think a final one for Adama is that the substance of his relationship with his son is finally revealed when they're in the commander's quarters and they hug. You know, there have been harsh words and there's been estrangement and there's been rancor, but they love each other. And that's, that's the important thing. I think Kara has a bit of a test of her own as well, in that she reveals to Lee the truth about Zack's death. She didn't have to do that. She could have kept it quiet and nobody would have been any worse off, but in the face of potential annihilation, her conscience told her that she had to. And you might even want to throw in Baltar in there as well. He is tested too in terms of where his loyalties are, which he kind of answers in his own particular Baltar way, and actually involves a test to determine whether people are humans or Cylons. So that's the theme manifesting very clearly in the plot there. So a lot of testing going on, a lot of me saying the word test and saying the word testing, but that's our miniseries. Onwards to season one. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. At least you said test and not the time we were playing Warhammer, and I asked <laughs> uh, our friend was, "Have you got any testes to do?" Yes. Yes. The plural of test isn't testes. No, it's not. No. Um, don't make that mistake. <laughs> there is, I think, a, spot on with Rosalind being yeah. tested. Yeah. And and that decision weighing heavily, or you could just see it in her eyes. Again, fantastic acting. Yeah. But with the uh, the two Adamas, yes, all right. There's there's that hug. But then they go back to the estrangement at the end, and you know, again, Dad hasn't got any time for son, and tells him, you know, another another time, and it's like you get the feeling like, yeah, that's part of the problem with their yeah. relationship. It's yeah. always been another time, and he's never made the time for it. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Hey, all. We've heard from Daria. Hello, Borgs of Broadcast. Daria here. Just jumping back. I think I've got to say I agree with Anne Marie that sometimes it's difficult to make a made-up swear word or slang or expression land. They Frack, Frack kind of manages it. Smeg, yeah, a few others, but sometimes it just really doesn't. Like Vogelkarb, which I can barely even say naturally, let alone utter in a moment of distress or stress. Anyway, back to 2003 and miniseries night two. Oh, so Lee, 
Apollo, younger Adama, made us here after all. And I like the way he and his dad, the two Adamas, are starting to reconcile a bit. But as they even say to themselves, it's not all happening overnight. And that's good because people don't always work that way. At sometimes scenes that people on TV just run hot and cold for their feelings about something. Or indeed about each other. There are lesser shows where this incident would make them completely appreciate each other and bend all past pain just like that and it's good to see that they're going to still work at it because they've obviously been on the office for quite some time. Similarly, Adama, Senior Adama, William Adama and President Roslyn at the end, they start to move a bit together onto the same page. They haven't completely reconciled but they're being practical and realising that being at each other's throats is not going to help anyone in the fleet, less of all themselves or each other. So I like that emotions are actually playing out here with some kind of progress, arc, nuance, and not just, oh, I've heard the magic line, and now this is how I feel. Elsewhere in the episode, and jumping subject matter entirely, that Leoben Connor, he looks sick, so credit to the actor and the makeup artist for doing that. He looked like he had some kind of nasty infection, flu, goodness knows what, which if that's what happens when a Cylon hangs around with weapons radiation for days and days and days, then, well, hats off them because it looks really, really uncomfortable. And on that note, nice to see that Cylons do look out for each other and they don't just perpetually screw each other over because they're the bad guys and that's what bad guys do. I haven't really watched any of these since they first came out 15 however many it is years ago so rather than spoil myself and try to provoke my memory i'll just watch along with your lovely podcasts so once again thanks for making it and i'll talk to you next time thanks daria thanks daria bye uh, you're right yes definitely difficult to have makeup swear words land sometimes maybe it's a one syllable thing smeg works one yeah. syllable frack, frack works, works yeah. one syllable drop from judge dread yeah works yeah maybe it's a Single syllable, you can land it. Yeah. More than that, you're going to have a problem. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, it is much more realistic to have it be that both with Adama and Rosalind and then also with, with the two Adamas, you know, it's not, oh, everything's all fixed because you said the magic words. People will blow hot and cold. It is yeah. more realistic to have it that way. And uh, Leoben did look like he had the, yeah, the, the, the space herpes or something. Yeah, he did it, yeah. very ill, yes. <laughs> Isn't space herpes what they had in Ice Pirates? Uh, possibly, yes. <laughs> Thank you for that reminder. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and we've heard from Nama God. Oh, Henry, when I start having baby, it's bombs all right, kids, in tonight's episode, we learned don't ever trust your smoke detector. Okay, well, now this is a brilliant half episode. I don't know how you're taking these ones, but yeah, this is a brilliant 90 cent on, so we're still doing that. A brilliant 19 minutes worth of episode here. Thinking back, I'm afraid I haven't listened to your previous podcast yet, so I don't know what everyone made of it, but I think I was probably a little bit down sounding on the episodes that were covered in your last podcast. But thinking back on it, I guess there's no real way to make the entire near extinction of the human race a fun and lighthearted subject, so I guess it was always going to be a little bit downbeat. With this pair of episodes, I'm going to keep on a pair of episodes, even though it's not really, but that's just what the voice in my head is saying to me and unfortunately looks just like me so that's disappointing but anyway this pair of episodes is a lot more like it as not just the action but the character stuff is better as well my favourite thing that's starting to come to the fore now is the relationship between the civilian and the military governments I actually love how the civilian fleet and the colonial fleet come together and eventually they work out some sort of ideal I like that in this iteration of Battlestar Galactica that it's not one man who is holding the entire fleet together it's not the charismatic everyone's favourite space grandpa Lorne Green no this is a different Adama he is more of a military man and it's more understandable and on the other hand you've got Laura Roslin who is is a fantastic president. She's only been in the job for a few hours, but already she's making the tough decisions, and there are some horrifically tough decisions she has to make. She has to actually sacrifice thousands of people in order to let the better part of humanity escape, and that's a crushing, soul-destroying moment. Just when you think they're going to have their own aggro ship, which isn't reused stock footage, they go and blow it up again and blow up the little girl as well. And, and it's harsh, but these are the kind of decisions that are going to be made in these times. And I think what's nice about the program is that it doesn't ever put that forward as being the right choice. It's there for you, the viewer, to decide whether she made the right call or not, because the characters themselves remain conflicted, and that's what I really like. So I like this conflict and the fact that Adama starts to see things Roslyn's way is interesting. I'd be interested to see how this dynamic plays out across the future of the show with a, obviously a balance between the military and the civilian governments. Another highlight of the episode for me is Volta and his growing delusion. Or is it delusion? Does he have a chip in his head? Whatever the case, he's seeing Six who isn't there and whatever she's doing to him, I mean, he's definitely experiencing it as seen by the look in his face when he's in CNC and I mean, that's a beautiful moment when she's, I don't know what she's doing but we don't get to see. But is it all in his head? Is it not? It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. But what is really great is the way that Jamie 
Bamber. I think that's the actor. Portrays Baltar's duplicity in the way that he's able to lie to both to himself and to others, and he's able to keep this dual conversation going on in his head, whether it's actually a real thing that's happening or not, and still be able to put on a facade of being a semi sane human being who's able to have some sort of use to the outside world. And he's scheming. I mean, this is a different Baltar, isn't it, to the original Galactica? And I'm going to segue right now. I found that a lot of the way through the first season of this reimagined Galactica, I was having a little problem with the characters in the storyline, just trying to square them up to the originals. I know it wasn't, because we've got a completely different set of actors, a completely different scenario, but still, I was looking for familiar concepts to come through, and they don't so much. And this time around, I'm actually enjoying it more because I'm able to more easily relax into the characters in this new interpretation. So, and I'm loving that. But yeah, this Baltar isn't the scene of chewing John Cole across the old series, but he is just wonderful to watch in action. And in a way, he's more terrifying because he can convince himself that what he's doing is right. And it's an easy decision for him to make to just coldly pin the blame on being a Cylon on the first guy that Six picks on. As it turns out, he was right. He was a Cylon, and there are other Cylons, and one of them is Boomer. Do, 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 do. Yeah, that really deserved the EastEnders drums at that moment. There's a lot of really interesting stuff shaping up here. As we're left with the promise of not just tensions between various characters, I mean, I love how Starbuck refuses to allow Ty to apologise. The slightly uneasy, not a reconciliation, but at least uh, being pleased to see each other'sness of the younger and older Adamas. But then also the promise of tensions between the civilian and military governments, and also the intrigue. There are Cylons in the fleet. Someone left that message for Adama. Who are they? Are they sleeper agents? We'll just have to find out, won't we? The only bum point of the episode for me, really, and this is a really minor niggle, is the stuff on the space station. It was really clever how Adama was able to figure out that Leoban was in indeed a Cylon, even though he'd never met a humanoid Cylon before. But this shows that this commander is a force to be reckoned with. But unfortunately not in the fighting stakes. He's definitely no William Shatner. Actually, no, he is a William Shatner in that the blows that were traded were clearly, clearly not contacting at all. That was some awfully staged fake fighting. But that aside, all that stuff on the station was great. And I know I was probably a bit down on the CGI models last week, because I'll always have a fondness in my heart for physical models. But the stuff around Ragnarok Station this episode was just absolutely gorgeous. I love the flying into the clouds, atmosphere, whatever. The space battles were tense and wonderful. And yeah, I'm actually going to afford this. I really love the action sequences in this one. I'm slowly getting into the groove of this style of CGI and you know, not being models. And we actually get to see more than a couple of actions that the actors are performing. It's not just the Cylon Raiders being flown over and three of them looking to the right and look to the left. And we get to see the fantastic shot of Starbuck taking in Apollo into the landing bay with that crazy crash manoeuvre just in time for them to make the jump to hyperspace. They don't they make a fast than light jump. Now that's one thing that is interesting because they make a great big deal about using the FTL in this episode. It seems to be a dramatic thing so it'll be interesting to see if they continue using the FTL with this kind of tension and seriousness as the series progresses. So yeah, I've got a feeling they won't do but it was interesting to see it taken that way. This isn't a usual thing to be using faster than lights, and which really suggests that the Twelve Colonies were all in the same solar system. But that's a debate for another time, I think. Although, if not this podcast, when? But I sense I'm running out of time. And the final thing that I find really interesting this is that there's a great mirroring between the Cylons and the humans, and in that the creators fighting their war against their gods, or well, if not gods, then against the creator. You know, the Cylons are the children who are rising up against their creators, and also they've got their own religion. It seems, whereas the Twelve Colonies are obviously polytheistic, the Cylons appear to have some sort of monotheistic religion. If it is indeed the case, if it's not just all down to the six in Baltar's head, although I think she said something about that when she was actually alive on the planet, so I think it is actually the Cylon's religion. But that's just really interesting, because obviously coming from a Judeo-Christian background, it's quite often the case in Western shows that it's the monotheistic religions that are the norm, and that it's the polytheistic or you know, any sort of different belief, which is the weird outsider that's either to be conquered, feared, or, in the case of early next generation, patronised. So that's just a really interesting turn of events, and what I like about this is that, as well as taking the core concept of, of humanity being on the run from the Cylons that the original pilot episode had, we've also got a religious thread to it, in the way the original Galactica seemed to me with the Bible or the Book of Mormon or whatever it was. But yeah, this has been interesting to see develops. So yes, very much enjoying this. Very much looking forward to next week's episode. Kind of not having to remember what it is, but that's not to put you off at all. It's a great episode. Very much looking forward to it. And once I finally get around to looking at my now back up podcast, looking forward to seeing what everyone else made of this as well. So yes, very much looking forward to being on this journey. And I hope, and I suspect, so say we all. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It is different to have the baddies religion be the monotheistic yes. one. Yes. Yeah, and that moment when she says God is love, which has particular connotations to Christianity, it's like, woo, yeah. <laughs> feels weird coming from somebody we think of as a baddie. <laughs> yeah, very strange. Yeah, it's James Callis who plays Baltar, uh, Jamie Banbury's Apollo. Yeah, I look quite like the fight, actually. I thought it was sort of brutal and, and clumsy. You know, not your stylish Shatner type fight, but something that was actually a bit more realistic for me. And it sort of cut away, away from any sort of serious blows you just see a bit of blood splatting don't you so yeah. thank you sir thank you what did drew and tracy make of this and we just watched part two of the miniseries oh my god <laughs> stress levels are up on that one yes let me just tell you colonial one yep he's there hurrah yeah, survived. survived we guessed that i did forget that in this reimagined that they actually jump so when yes. they were like prepared to oh, jump yeah, i was yeah. like are we watching Discovery? Oh, yeah, that's right. Because yes, I, I had yes, forgotten all about that. Did. But, yeah, it's quite effective. Yeah, it's good. I like it. It's a good effect, isn't it? Bit of hard viewing. 
when Colonial One jumped and left all the yes. ships behind, that was really quite hard. I, I know. Like, on the one hand, last week she was saying, like, we're not leaving all these people behind. We've got to rescue them. And then the next minute she's going, oh, we've got to get away from them. But I guess, yeah. like like Apollo said, it was a bit of a numbers game. It was either certain amount survive or none survive. But then, in a way, she flipped it again because this one, she's like, I don't really give a shit about your war. What we need to do is save mm. the race and we need to find somewhere where, where people can start making yes. babies and stuff like that. So, and that bugged me because she needs to get her nose out because... You know, I was saying to you, why is she interfering in military matters? Adama is here to command the fleet to try and win a potential war. And she's just like, oh, let's just go off and find a planet well, and have Well, no, lots she's of saying the war's over. And plus, she's, but like it's the, not over. she's the government, isn't she? She's she's the, the real person who should be in charge. No, because that's, that's absolutely bollocks. It's like Trump being in power. What the fuck does he know about military or governing? anything mm, she was like 47th example, think, yeah. like senator or something See, of what, flowers what, should, uh... what does that make her like how does that give her any kind of information or power to govern the military but but a dharma shouldn't be in charge of everything though should he but he's not he's only in charge yeah, of his fleet there i don't know hey, this is an argument that's going to go on <laughs> through the series isn't it guys is making me die He's such episode. a good actor, isn't he? Jamie Cannon. When he's in the chair and like the female Cylon is just getting it on with him. He's yes. just really made... I felt embarrassed for him. It was <laughs> funny. Like, you're like, oh, he's getting an erection. <laughs> and then that guy interrupted him. He was like, that was so funny. I did raw. So just going on about her, though, what, what is the score with this? So is she in his head? She not in his head? Because if she's in his head... She pointed out the device, didn't she? She did. So but she, how can she, she not be in his head? Because she can't be there. Well, exactly. She is. She, but she says about, I might. Did I put a chip in your brain? It, exactly. I was going to say, is Gaius like a a sign? Oh, is he a sign on you? Yeah. Because Ooh, too many questions. So she must be an external thing because she pointed out the the, yeah, the device. Same, yeah. But on the other hand, if she is a Cylon, like beaming into his brain. Why point out the device? But how does she not know what the fucking device is? It was in a bag. Well, she she might be a different model, might she? Because she oh, okay. her brain that one died on on mm. Caprica, didn't it? I don't know. It's weird. So let's just go to the ending now because it kind yes. of blew my brain. So I was saying to you, oh, that poor guy. They've shut him in like. Yes. The, the, um, what do you want to call it? The, the, the armory. Yeah, the armory, and like, oh my god, he's going to be there forever. And then all of a sudden, when they opened up, I was like. Here's a silent. Here's a silent. Oh, no, Here's a silent. I can't believe you'd forgotten then, about I know. that. And then when they came in, and then I was just like, <laughs> boom! Oh, no. oh, it's just, oh, oh, it's just so intense. I feel very stressed now. <laughs> so, a bit going on to like the, uh, the same thing about the woman Cylon, like in Gussie's head. Who left the note and why? What? Why would you possibly leave the note? I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't. Many, many many like I said, just says it. This. Almost like a four-parter has kind of like opened your brain now. Yes. I want more. I need answers. And now, because yes. it was zero, uh, Series zero. Series zero. Season zero. Amazon Prime, yeah. And now it's going to start. Yes. And now it's like, fucking hell. I well, let, let's get on with it. I, Great excited. stuff, though. Yeah, really enjoying this. Love yep. it. Leave it there. Okay. See you later. Bye. 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 <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Oh, so it blew Tracy's brain. Yay, excellent. <laughs> I remember the, the surprise at Duran at the end, because the first time I watched it, I was just so convinced that they, he'd been unjustly imprisoned. Yeah. But then it turns out, oh, hang on, no, he hasn't. <laughs> but yeah, Rosalind is the recognised leader of yeah. the human race at this point, because she's the dutifully sworn in president. So uh, otherwise, if it's... Adama, then they've got a military dictatorship, which clearly yeah. isn't healthy, so yeah. And she says, you know, are you staging a coup? Are you going to, you know, invoke military law? But this this is a thing that will come back again and again. You know, who's actually in charge is an interesting, you know, when you're in this sort of perilous situation, it's, it's an interesting question. So, yes, there's no easy answers on this one. No. I suppose there's not for any... Depending on how you're, wherever way you're set up as a as a country, sort of here and now today, it's not easy when there's war, isn't it? Because no. you love your president or your prime minister or whatever it is you've got. Yeah. Possibly a royal family in some places. 
that have power in the way that ours don't, and you've got a war on who's making the decisions. Mm -hmm. I think that was what's quite interesting about the Second World War is the way in which we had a a so-called government of national unity, which Mm. anyway, initially, it it deteriorated a bit later on, but initially it was a government made up of all the parties, basically. Yeah. And we've heard from Puri. Hello, Orgs. Now, uh, it's an odd thing with this series. Like I say, I'm, I'm hoping to try and give as unbiased views as possible, but this really is, for such a grim, dark series, it's really weird to say that this is like slipping on a warm jumper, a uh, familiar old bit of clothing that you just slip right back into. But that's how I kind of am feeling with this for the moment. Yeah, and, and considering that the series does get a little relentlessly grim, it's really weird to be so familiar. I think it is because I've got to know these characters over the years, and it's really great to see them back at the start. There are some lovely touches in this. Again, I said last time that Eddie almost is brilliant and he has some of the most fantastic moments in this. It's good that he actually gets a little action. I forgot that Adama usually spends his time in the control centre commanding stuff, but in this he does get to do kind of the walking through corridors with the, the guy who pans out to be a Cylon. And I love the idea that you could see Adama's already worked out that the guy's a human Cylon because he knows why they built uh, Ragnar Anchorage there. And uh, the effects work again. I've got to, st- you know, standoutly brilliant stuff. The drive into Ragnar Anchorage has a really good good hunt for the Red October feel, you know, that there's specific turns they have to make at certain times. I thought that was actually really good. There's also that, I mean, I think I've mentioned to people before, that absolutely gorgeous shot. Now, I do like laser beams and shields and stuff, but I do love a point defence system and, you know, when sometimes they're hurling real things. And I think it was Andy who actually told me uh, that, yes, the scene near the end when you have this sort of final battle, I mean, I love the way the glitch just kind of comes out, sets itself up at the mouth of that kind of big green swirly thing and starts hurling everything it's got. And he told me, apparently, the the shells are meant to be... It's basically, he's launching, they're launching exploding Volkswagen Beetles at the Cylons. But just that, that wide shot you get with all the Cylon missiles coming in and the kind of absolute strength stream of point defence fire and flak coming from the Galactica detonating the missiles as they approach was just a gorgeous shot. And the battle surrounding it as well is quite visceral, very fast cuts. I love the way they've kind of taken what Babylon 5 did with the idea that space battles don't need to be like fighter planes that they can and this turns it into an absolute chaotic, I mean literally, uh, some people call a dogfight a furball and uh, this is literally the crafters zooming around, they're flipping up their axis, you, know, you could be on someone's tail but that doesn't matter, they'll flip themselves over and start firing back at you. That sort of thing is really cool and just the way ships change direction constantly so yeah I did like other oh, Baltar stuff <laughs> even actually had my wife laughing when the, the six that's possibly in his head so he's definitely talking to a six in his head or something he's seeing one that she starts kind of uh, getting a bit sexy with him and then the bloke who actually pans out to be a Cylon comes up to us kind of uh, are you okay yeah it was that kind of embarrassing bit of he's basically having a sexy times on its own and I, it was some nice humour there was also I think what it does really well there's they do like in, in amongst the grimness and death and horror they do like to give you some occasional uplifting scenes so you had that scene where everyone had found out other people are alive and it's specifically it's kicked off when Tyrrell and Boomer meet each other again and they they kind of go in for a kiss and you've got that kind of lovely sort of it's it's very choral but uh, kind of sing-songy music and it is just that bit where it's not like anything's better but just for a brief part we do get to appreciate the fact that everyone's still alive and you know there is some at least vague niceness to be got out of the universe you know this kind of the basic I think the idea is that and it's something that goes through the series a lot is for all the horrors that happen there is that kind of a basic humanity and uh, sort of human contact and human kindness that can occasionally give you some brief respite from the utter grimness of the situation. Now, I did like the twist. The, end. the scene at the end when Adam was doing his big speech, I did hear a rumour that I think it was the second set of So Say We Alls was actually because at the time the cast didn't think the series was going to get picked up. So everyone was a bit down. So when he said, did came to the end of his speech and said, so say we all, everyone kind of just goes, so say we all. And Edward almost being, he's actually quite method, started improvising, kind of drumming them up. 
and that's what kind of got people going, and that's what they kept because it, it looks really, and it is a really good scene. And then there is that kind of twist at the end, which is a really good way of setting up some of the dynamics. So you have the dynamic between Adama and Rosalind, where she says, "I knew the president. I've never heard of this secret location of Earth." And Adama basically goes, I made it up, they need something to shoot for. And she says, well, they'll hate you for it. He's like, yeah, they probably will. And so it tells us a lot about Adama in that, yes, he will. Here's how I'm solving this problem at the moment, and I will deal with the consequences later. But also the idea that he's willing to kind of get, uh, you know, Rosalind doesn't know that he could essentially take over the fleet. He has a big battle star that could just start punching holes in ships if he chose to. But he's already had that revelation that there's only 50,000 humans left, and I think they really do push that forward. And I mean, I did love the line when he's watching and he suddenly says, we're going to have to start having babies. And I think it's uh, Gaida says, is that an order, sir? And again, some nice little bits of levity, but this idea that, yes, they've suddenly realised that... I mean, I did like Rosalind constantly drumming. There was a war. We lost. Now we can only survive. And I think that's a really good way of putting it, that there is no fight to take to the silence, anything suicide. And yeah, so overall... I mean, I remember actually when I first saw it, I thought I, I was a bit down in the second part. I thought it got a bit slow and talky. But actually, I thought the slow talky bits really worked. I thought those kind of really fitted in and actually did give us a break from sort of the action, so to speak. So yeah, overall the pilot I think is actually a lot better than I gave it credit for. I was lukewarm in it I think I said last time when I saw it. And actually watching it now, no, this is a really good pilot. It might be because I know where it's going and I know the characters now. And I, I did like the way that it wasn't solving things by the end. You know, yes there is still issues between Adama and Apollo but they have ob- they do know that there's worse things in the universe at the moment and there is an, as an extent of people having a feeling of life being too short as well and I thought that's quite a quite a neat idea so yeah I'm for I'm really looking forward to looking through this series again and I'm hoping it's not got too many disappointments but there are some definite moments that I'm looking forward to coming up bye for now bye sir cheers yes there is very much a sort of submarine approach to mm. the way the Galactica goes in through the green cloud and yeah we can see the the displays where they're tilting to one side yeah. and the other that's really cool According to Ron Moore's commentary, the whole thing about So Say We All was a result of Olimos coming out with that. It, was, it wasn't scripted. And the reason why people initially don't answer very loudly is because they didn't know what to say because mm. he's, he's gone off beast, basically. Yeah. So then he could say So Say We All and, you know, as Perry said, he's very in the moment. So yeah. then... But yeah, it's it's all a result of not so much that they're not thinking it was going to be picked up, but rather actually the fact that it just felt like the right thing to be saying yeah. at that moment, so he went with it. And in Trek, they weren't allowed to do that. You had to keep to the script, and if any changes whatsoever had to be approved up the line and took yeah. ages for approval, whereas the, uh, Rumble allowed things to be a bit more fluid and encouraged the actors to be a bit more improvisational. Cool, worked well. So then... We enter Series 1 proper next time. Yeah. For the first two episodes, we'll be looking at the episode 33, which I believe involves the FTL, so there is a bit more on that. And the episode Water. Very brief titles, but we'll be recording on Friday the 6th of September. Until then, so say we orgs. So say we orgs. The music at the beginning of this podcast was arranged and performed by Drew Barker. All other music is used for illustrative purposes only, and no copyright infringement is intended. The artwork for Broadcast Galactica was created by Andy Pelastides. To contact us, send emails or mp3s to broadcast at gmail.com. Contact us via Twitter at rev underscore org or broadcast ammo. Hashtag broadcast. Visit our website at galactica.libsyn.com or view images relating to our cast on our Tumblr site, broadcast.tumblr.com. And there's also a Spotify playlist with all our playout tunes on it. Shut it down! Fire command.